down. Reel down again. Little step. Little oh my God. One or two at a time. That's, that's insane. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Fish and Fuel podcast. Uh, we've got a very special show here today. I've got two brothers here, twin brothers, matter of fact, uh, that drove all the way up from South Carolina. We are going to be talking about striper fishing. If you would, guys, introduce yourselves, uh, if you don't mind. My name is David Richardson. My name's Tommy Richardson. David Richardson and Tommy Richardson. Now, what part of South Carolina are y'all from? I'm from Aiken, South Carolina, but I, I live in Leesville, South Carolina, which is on Lake Murray. So basically the, the center part of the state. And I'm from Aiken, South Carolina, and I live in Cross, South Carolina, which is between Lake Moultrie and Lake Marion. Now, Y'all both, y'all, y'all both striper fish. Like y'all are, like y'all are a team on the water, pretty much. I mean, well, actually, we're against each other as teams now. We used oh. to be as team. Now we fish against each other. Oh man! Yeah, our sons have got into it, so we we compete against each other. So it's a pretty good uh, battle for the family. That's cool. Well, if I had a twin brother and he beat me in a tournament, striper fishing or any type of fishing, I would just, I would just take that photo of you holding first place trophy i'd post it on facebook and block it where you couldn't see it and say i won i guess i guess that could work because y'all look so so close in, in looks that's pretty wild so y'all fish against each other now with your son yes sir that's a good time man that's awesome so how long have you been strike fishing what kind of got you guys into strike fishing how long how long you been doing it because you guys are well have a a, a ton of knowledge in it I would say uh, from as a kid, our granddad um, had a place at Atkins Landing at Lake Moultrie, and we would spend our summers down there. So I couldn't tell you age group, but probably as soon as we get old enough to hold a fishing rod, and we just fell in love with striper fishing. He crappy fished, striper fished. He, he was a, a part-time guide, but he fished all the time, and we fell in love with it. And then we both joined the military and served our country and got away from it. But when we got back, when we got right back into it and started striper fishing. That's awesome, man. And thank you guys so much for your service. We uh, love to get plugged in with the veterans through Fish and Fuel and as well with uh, uh, Catch the Fever. And they're also well connected in uh, some other organizations that do a tremendous job and, and really do a lot of good for people. And we're going to be getting into that as we go through the podcast for sure. And But let's dive into it. Let's talk striper fishing. All right. So what is your primary body of water that you enjoy fishing the most what, what's the primary body of water well if I, I could choose i live on lake murray which is a great fishery but clark hill is where i caught my biggest fish in my life and and it just it's amazing i had a great time clark hill clark hill or, or lake thurman lake thurman is what they call it but i, I like uh lake cherokee tennessee um because you can go up there and catch 15 to 20 pound fish all day long like it's nothing and so and, and it's, it's full of bait so you can catch your bait go fishing as far as trophy fish, I like going up there. A watch bar, watch bar is another good thing. Yeah, I've been up that way before, and uh, yeah, there's no lack of quality fish. That's for sure. So, tell me a little bit about like you know it's winter time right now. Uh, we're in January, uh, mid January, and then we're going to be coming into spring. A guy that's got a lake nearby and he wants to get into striper fishing. What what's something that's right now winter that really is that that you should look out for kind of helping a guy get targeted for striper or he just went out this weekend he's having a, a hard time what's some things that he might should look for to to be more productive striper fishing so basically the the fish are just like any other fish they might start migrating so the stripers start migrating up the rivers but the problem is with the temperatures the way they are they migrate up the rivers and they will a lot of times stop in the deepest part of that of that body of water. Mm -hmm. So what I've seen 
is they will migrate up the, rock, the, the rivers and then sometimes instead of going into the back of the creeks, they will stop in the mouth. And so the deepest point of that creek or that, that river is where they've been holding up a lot of times. Now, later in the day when the sun rises, they could go up to the shallows and some shoals and points, but mostly they're right at the, the deepest point trying to hold up. And people don't realize that's the warmer body of water. Absolutely. That's interesting. So when you're breaking down a lake, you're, you, you see that big creek arm that comes off the main body of water. You're saying a lot of times this time of year, especially those striper fit, those striper will stage up in the deepest part where that creek channel kind of goes in. That's right. Right, right around the mouth yes, of sir, it. Yes, sir. That's right. Is that mainly because of what the bait's doing? You know, the bait is either going in and out this time of year or, you know, what, what makes you, what do you think they're, they're well, doing? Well, the bait's obviously up? bunching up mm -hmm. and they're staying close together because of the temperatures. And a lot of times they're getting that deeper water because it's warmer. Right. And so the fish will do the same. Now, one thing that we are doing too that we're starting to pick up on is in the deeper pool, like towards the dam, they're starting to get in real deep water. And so like I went out um, Monday and we were catching fish in 75 foot of water, which is really not not normal, but the bigger fish have been there, you know, and so we've figured out a way to catch them and, uh, and do a good job at doing it. So um, like we caught, uh, I think, nine stripers and the biggest was almost nine pounds and the smallest was seven, which is good for Lake Murray. Yeah. And yeah. so, um, and obviously it depends what kind of bait. You know, one thing that we always look at this time of year is water temperature. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't, don't agree, but you know, the colder it is, everything slows down. So mm -hmm. they start feeding on really, really small bait. And so a lot of times we don't, we don't keep a lot of fish, but when we do, we will cut it open and see what it's eating. And a lot of times it dictates what size bait we use. And so that's made, that makes, that's made a game changer by looking at some of those and then realizing, like, you know, we had one the other day that were cut open and they were feeding on really, real small brim. So we knew to change our bait to real small stuff, something that looked like a brim or even a brim. Yeah. You know, so. Um, Absolutely. That's good stuff. That's good information. So let me ask you guys this when you're talking about, you know, when you're cutting them open and you're looking for the size bait, I feel like, because being up in Tennessee, fishing with my good friend, Anthony Johnson, uh, Bushworkers Guide Service out there, there was a time where, I mean, it was, he, he had done a technique that I'd never seen done before, where he had like 50, 60 striper coming up and hitting. And I mean, they were just all around us. And that video is actually on the Catch Fever YouTube channel. And he was hooking these small baits and throwing them out there on a free line. And it was maybe five seconds and boom, it's hooked up. But what started happening was in that bait tank, we finally started running out of those smaller baits. And you would get a bait that was just an inch bigger. Throw it out there, nothing would touch it. What is your opinion on, because a guy can get at the mouth of that creek or he can ride around and graph, learn bait patterns, and still, I believe that can hang a guy up. What's y'all's opinion on not getting the profile? Because profile, I think, is critical for matching the hatch on, on what you're trying to target. Oh, I agree. And because if you don't know what kind of bait, that's why I like to catch bait out of the lake that the fish are being caught of. And so you know what size bait and what kind of bait they're fishing in or what they're biting. And so a lot of times we will, like you said, we, we'll look at the inside the fish but then we'll look at the bait patterns. And a lot of times this time of year, people will follow the birds because the birds will, uh, will chase the bait and the, and the fish will bring the bait up. But a lot of times that's small fish. And so we, 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 when we're fishing for tournaments or even doing guide trips, we want to catch the bigger quality fish. And so we like to really, and a lot of people will pull the bigger bait and think the bigger bait, bigger fish. Right. But I've caught in a tournament a 25-pound striper on a minnow, on a, on a, on a large shiner. Because because that was the size bait because we couldn't get no herring smaller so I'm thinking well what size bait and a lot of times thread fin are hard to keep alive mm -hmm. and so we try to find the bait that matches the length or the size and that's a game changer a lot of times game changer and I'm that's why this podcast will always do different species of fish this is not a catfishing podcast this is not a crappy podcast this is not a a wall or a or striper podcast this is a fishing podcast and it's just for what you're saying because doing interview after interview with with fantastic anglers just like yourselves it's amazing 
where even with a different species of fish, how things line up the same way. Exactly what you say, how those fish are triggered and what you're looking for. Um, not all the time, you know, so much the bigger bait, but the smaller sizes, that's really what they're targeting, catch those bigger fish. You see that correlation with other species of fish too. And it's just amazing how their brains work, you know. Now, obviously, striper will feed and, and do things differently than a catfish or, or this fish. But, you know, matching the hatch is definitely the common denominator for a key to success. It, it, it sounds like for sure with striper fishing. Yeah, and in, in, in a lot of lakes, too, like up the rivers, a lot of times in the fall and the spring, they target gizzard shad because that's what's up there. In the main lakes, there's more herring. So obviously, definitely, you know, it depends on what they're, they're feeding on, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and you can obviously get them to do bite on certain things, certain ways if you, you know, keep. And there's times when I'm patient, I know what I see on my graph and I believe in it and I will work hard until... I get a reaction bite. And there's a lot of little things that we do sometimes to get a reaction bite. Let's talk about that because I know in my mind, <clears throat> I don't, I, I am not a professional uh, striper fisherman, rockfish, wherever you're at, where, you know, they call it different things. But it is today, somebody asked me just last week, what is your favorite fish to go after right now? And I grew up as a catfish. Catfish has my heart. I'm a catfisherman through and through. Um, but right now it is striper fishing. We went out to a media camp and we broke away and they were filming catfish stuff. We did striper stuff. And it seems like anytime I'm on the boat, uh, being just, you know, not targeting them full time like you guys, I it, it is very common for me to kind of see it as running and gunning, you know, live action. But you just said that sometimes you will wait on them for striper. And I think a lot of new guys and even guys that's, you know, been striper fishing dozens of times you think running and gunning like if you drop them down and they're not hitting it it's time to reel them up and go talk about waiting on striper what makes you wait on them and, and what's your approach a few years ago me and my brother was in this big tournament we never won a big tournament and so me and my brother and our kids was in this big tournament we we took the whole week off and we fished the whole week we caught zero stripers and so Took the whole week, the whole week, the whole week, it was muddy. It was kind of like what it is now with flooding and all. And so he's like, and so a lot of times pre-fishing people think you're catching fish, but pre-fishing we eliminate water. And so what we did is we decided to go to a spot. We haven't fished the whole time. Is it Clark Hill? We had fished Georgia, little river, Carolina, little river, fished the lower end. The only place we had not fished was people normally do not fish is the upper end, except for in the summertime. And so we decided to go all, all or nothing, hero, zero, we went to the upper end, and as we were in the upper end, we was in this area that we, we call the fishbowl, and we we kept marking these large arches, and 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 and, and we, we we never could get them to bite, but we said we're gonna stay with it. We're gonna find and out. We what kept going are. over and over and over, and at twelve thirty, my cork and the back of the boat started coming to the boat like a torpedo was was behind it, and it was chasing, and I started I couldn't catch it long enough. By the time I got to the motor, it went under. And so what kept us there was those large arches and we kept trying everything we could under the sun to get them to bite, but we knew they were there and we just kept working that area until they got ready to feed. And once they got to feed, they fed for 30 minutes. We caught four good fish and all we needed was three and we won the tournament. That is fire. That is awesome, man. That is killer. Now you saw those fish. You said they were, they were kind of like dormant. They were just kind of sitting there. And I see posts on Facebook a lot of times where people, even striper fishermen, because we 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 sponsor with Catch Fever. We've got a striper lineup. We got striper anglers. We're working with you guys now uh, on the striper side. You know they'll post those arches, and it's kind of like off of a point or something. And they're like, you know, waiting for them to turn on or something. When you're waiting for them and you're targeting them like that, you said you were using a cork. So talk about that setup when you're when there's when when you're not targeting striper drawing the ends and shooting through the bait and they're sitting there like that what's the setup look like so some some people just pull plain the boards and corks and some people pull down rods we'll pull up the 16 to 20 rods we'll put down rods down 16 to 20 20 rods so we, we, we have we have about six to eight down rods we have three planing boards on each side and then we have some corks which are like a a planing board but it stays out behind the boat and a lot of right. times like a ready Rigged style, red, red rig. It's a ready rig cork. Yep. But they got directional kind. And so what mm -hmm. we we 
that's what we a little cocked fin. Right. And so what we do is we try to put as, as many bait we can as wide as we can. And then if we see those bait, sometimes we'll stop on them. Sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll cut up chum and throw chum out. Sometimes we'll speed up, you know, and, and it really to get the bait to do in a reactionary and get a reactionary bite. And if, if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I always think the biggest thing is driver fishing that I've learned is knowing your equipment, mm-hmm. knowing what you're marking. Because I've seen people say, I'm marking these big strappers and it be a gar. I'm marking these big strappers and it be a, a, a catfish. And, you know, and, uh, and good stuff. Yeah. live scopes change the game. Now, I'm not yes. real familiar with it, but I've learned my equipment where I feel like I know what I'm marking. Mm-hmm. And then, obviously, figuring out what they're feeding on. And we'll try all kind of things. There's some secrets and, you know, people are probably going to kill me. But one thing that we do a lot of times, we can't get them to buy it. I'll grab a $2 bait out of my bait tank and I'll clip the tail and throw it and it shoots straight down. And sometimes just that reaction. Or, you know, we were at a tournament, you know, several years ago fishing for Team of the Year at Midland Strawberry Club and we kept marking fish and I told the guy that was with me, a young kid, I said, I'm gonna power chum. He said, what's that? So I started emptying my bait tank. Start throwing out every bait I got. So power chumming is, is you said just you're, you're emptying the- and a, and a bait are going crazy, which makes the fish's attention. And so as them bait, sometimes we, we get a, a net full of herring and we squeeze it and throw the herring out. They start going crazy like, like a, 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 you know, a chicken with its head cut off. And then that gets the bait, the fish's attention. And if you got bait down there and they're feeding on, then they start feeding. Cause I call it the ice cream cone effect. You know, you don't know you want an ice cream cone until like three of your buddies are sitting there eating one. You're like, man, I think, you know what? I didn't want one, but I will ta- I will have one. That is really cool. And that we've won cool. a lot of tournaments in the last 15 minutes by doing that that is you know, really good unbelievable so that is awesome that is awesome that's really cool. and you talked about identifying stuff on your graph and i have been striper fishing with live scope and crappy fishing with live scope but i see it i've seen it mostly in crappy uh crappy fishing where you know we're targeting like 20 some foot of water usually like during the summertime or springtime and well it's more in the summertime and you'll see the fish come in. And like you said, being able to identify what the species is, you'll know when it's a catfish. You'll see it like how he swims and how he moves in. And then you'll see a striper in like the, 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 the shape of him and how they act when what comes in. If you're not using live scope, what is the best way to be able to identify if you're looking at points or if you're looking at some? To say, hey, that is striper. I know largemouth sometimes will stack up in front of each other um, on the bottom, and you're able to tell. How do striper show up on the graph where you can be confident that you feel like it's striper? Well, the way that we were raised as a, as a kid, my grandfather used to always say they're stair step. So they'd be like a stair step. And the direction start from the bottom and they'll work their way up. He used to have an eagle depth finder, and that's the way he marked them. You know, and, and so it's not, now that we do it every day, we don't see it as normal, but we still see that, you know. And then obviously a lot of them is suspended. Not always. Now, if it's real shallow in the spring, they could be right on the bottom, right on the point. But most of the time, the fish are suspended. And then obviously the, the way we've always noticed it is it seems like the, the, the better the arch the more, the more aggressive, the more aggressive, the more likely. Rather than like this, That's like right. a catfish. Okay, so what you're saying, because this is, I'm learning too. A catfish, it seems like it's it's almost like it's 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 a half moon like that. But you're saying striper is more like, gotcha. And even more. hybrids have even a sharper arch because they're a little bit wider. True. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, I could see that. That's good information. And see, that is why we like having just killer anglers that have been doing this a long time. Because yeah, I mean everything we're asking you guys are not just answering but kind of i mean really going in depth and i'm i'm learning a lot myself so as far as now that's that's a lot of times like in lake you the lake murray i've been out there that's a lake um i went out there during the summertime and i think we were done in an hour i mean it was just it was killer and those fish let me tell you something about lake murray striper if you hadn't been there's plenty of them in there and they are strong First time I went, I was like, yep, I got lake record. I got the lake record. And he was like, ooh, we're going to have to measure that one. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Like, that's not a citation. Like, you know, while I was fighting it, because I thought I had a 
dude, I thought I had something that was 20 pounds on there. And uh, he was like, yeah, it's about average. And I was like, and sure enough, when we brought him up out of 45 foot of water, he was an average fish. Those fish are powerful. Well, and a lot of times, you know, you know, as you make a catch to fever, medium light, the stealth rod, and that's the reason them fish feel so big. But certain times of year, those fish are so finicky. If you have a, a strong tip, they let go of it. And so the softer the tip, the better a lot of times. A lot of the anglers, especially me, I, I like we like to use 12-pound test line and medium light rods because of that finicky bite. Mm-hmm. And but, but it makes a great fight. It for does. a fish yes sir and you have to be able to see and when we when we developed the striper stealth rods we worked with mike smedley and chip bragg who's out there right. around lake murray and, stuff. and when we first brought up the topic of designing a striper rod they were like y'all do what we say you know uh, these rods have to be dialed in so specific because and i see why like with what y'all are saying and actually being out there through the process and even today that medium light for, you know, the size bait you're using and where you're at, but you will see, you can call it every time which rod's about to get hit. That rod will be just vibrating, and then all of a sudden it'll do like this, and that bait is just hunting, and then it gets smoked. And we actually, because of Lake Murray, had to design the striper rods with a specialized tip about this far from uh, the tip coming down. Because those fish, when they hit it, they're all the way up under the boat, already ten miles that way. And on a, on traditional rods, cheaper rods that you can just pick up anywhere, that are good rods. Don't get me wrong. If you're using you know thirty, forty, fifty dollars striper rod, that's a good rod. I know the striper rods are striper stuff rods are like one hundred twenty, but they're ten miles that way, and they will fold that rod up. And when you were trying to do what we were trying to do, which was incorporate backbone with a parabolic action you will break the tip off because those fish put it in such a critical bend we had to come up with something for them like lake murray striper to incorporate backbone with a super sensitive tip to where you can have some control and it doesn't kill the bait and the striper don't even know when when he grabs he don't feel any tension until it's too late but at the same time they can freight train that thing into a u just about so um yeah the rod i have noticed is absolutely critical for striper fishing there might be give in other areas of targeting fish and stuff like this and people will say it they're like well a rod is a rod let me tell you something guys not so much with striped fishing. I'm not saying you guys spend a ton of money, but make sure your set, and y'all know this, I'm talking to the, make sure your rod is designed for what you do and you'll get your feelings hurt a lot less. Well, I tell people there's four things you got to have to stripe fishing. Let's hear it. You got to have a trolling motor because you want to keep the proper speed. You got to have a graph so you can know what you're fishing for. Mm-hmm. You got to have a bait tank. Live bait is critical for stripers. If you want to catch quality fish, you can eat artificial all day long, but we like live bait to have good, lively bait. And then you got to have the right equipment. You got to have the right rods because you can have, we call them broomsticks. You can have a broomstick out there and outfish someone with a regular, with, somebody can outfish you with the right rod right beside you. I've seen it done. I've seen yeah. it done a hundred times. Yeah. Whether it's catfish, crappy, or striper, if you don't have the right rod, you, you, could, um, you, you can't catch no fish because they know the difference. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's why you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't crappy fish with a, with a striper. I mean, a catfish rod or a striper rod because that tip's critical for crappy fishing. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. A hundred percent. And I have, I, I've, I've seen it through the R and D process and even, even going into it with it now. And, um, you know, you had mentioned, uh, we talked about the rod and, uh, talked about, you know, uh, how to set up on these fish and kind of do that with as far as bait tanks. I see you got an extreme uh bait tank uh thing on that is that the tanks that i do I, i'm on pro use? staff at extreme bait tanks I, i've used a super bait tank I've, I've i've used uh the chiller bait tank and what i like about extreme the most is they it's like build a bear you can build a tank and so you can add any extra you want on a tank and so what what I, what we had problems with a lot of times transporting bait from tournament to tournament is we have batteries in back of our truck and a lot of times them batteries won't last all day and you got to bring extra battery extra battery with extreme, you can 
you can have the option put a 110 pump, which I got two 110 pumps in my, my tank. And so when I get home or get to the hotel, I can plug that 110 in. Don't worry about the batteries. Then I can go to sleep restful knowing my bait's good to go for the next morning. Well, that's why I wanted to ask about the bait tank because just for clarity, uh, Extreme is of no affiliation with this podcast or me in any way. Um, I do know Damien because we're in the fishing industry and I can't say enough what a outstanding guy that I think he is um, and how and what he's done with the company. But uh, no affiliation at all. The reason I ask about it is because there's probably no worse or feeling for a striper fisherman than if you go out there that next morning and your bait is dead. We've done that several times. What do you do in that situation? You got. I know you don't have that issue because you're using extreme. You got, you got to but... scramble fast. We have. We have. Um, and so me and my brother, we all. That's when. What's the one thing I also catch bait? That's one thing got me into catching bait. And so we always have a backup plan. So three tournaments ago, we were all going to Lake Cherokee. Me, my brother, his partner, and we all. We had about a um, 150 bait, primed, cured, ready for the tournament. So my brother goes ahead, his partner goes ahead. I'm the last guy in line, and so my brother left his battery on. He didn't have extreme then, and it killed his bait. My buddy on the way down, his partner, his battery went dead, killed all his bait. So we got the little bit of bait I got left in my tank that we got to use for tournament day. So pre fishing. Every night we were out catch, catching bait so we could pre-fish until the wee hours of the, of the night and get up in the morning to pre-fish. And so that's one good thing about having somebody on the team who knows how to catch a net. And so if you do if you do have a problem, you go out there and try to get the bait so you can yeah. pre-fish. Because a lot of times, that's one thing that it, that, that hurts um, a lot of times striper fishermen. If there's not a bait store, you know, you got to buy bait and bring it with you. Mm-hmm. But each state has different laws. And so you got to make sure you go by those laws. But a lot of times you can catch bait in those lakes if you know how to catch a cast in or know how to, you know, you know, locate those bait. And so that we always try to be up on that because you never know when, you know, something's going to happen with your bait tank. Yep. And that's why I like that 110. You yep. can just plug it right in and you don't have to worry about it. Yep. And you started using our fish and fuel cast nets. Yes, sir. A lot of people don't know that. That is not something um, that really I even... Uh, advertised this was a podcast first and foremost for information but you just got a hold of one of our fish and fuel cast net um people ask me all the time where can you get it jamie k down in south carolina sells them and then tacklebandit.com and christian moore up in uh virginia all those guys are on facebook and online but um y- you know a cast net's a whole different another ball game but being able to throw that uh, cast net and be able to get some bait in a hurry that is a game changer. Can, can I say something about the cast net? Sure. Now, I'm, I'm not. I'm you know I'm not sponsored by Fish and Fuel by no yeah. means. But Jamie K. gave me one of those cast nets and asked me to try it out because he knew I I, I I catch bait for a living. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I first grabbed it and and tried to throw it, I was like, I don't like this net because it's it was a ten foot five eighths one pound foot per radius, and I'm thinking this is a huge net. It felt like a fifteen foot net compared to a yeah. a five tech ten foot net. But I realized. That the five tech ten foot five eights was not completely stretched, conditioned, ready to go, and so a few a few weeks ago, me and my son was out catching bait, and he was on the boat with me, so he started throwing the five tech. I started throwing that net just to make myself throw that net, and I was catching three times as much bait as my son was, and it was amazing when when I threw it on the active target, you could see the five tech, and it would close up immediately, and that one was almost like a depot net. It stayed. The whole cone stayed big all the way down to the bottom, and that and that made me a a, a believer. Well, when I'm catching three, even though it's, it may be it may feel like it's a lot more net, if I'm catching three times the amount of bait in one cast versus three cast, I would rather do that, and it made me a believer in that net. Well, that's great. I'm really glad that you. Uh, I, I I appreciate that, uh, Jamie K. I mean, he's the bait man. He catches all the bait for. I call him the mayor of South Carolina. You know, he he he's he he's always dealt in bait and then you catch a lot of bait as as well and help Jamie in, in that department as well. And, um, he's the one that came to me and was like, look, I know you don't like cookie cutter stuff. I need to, I need to design a net. I need to, to, and I was like, Jamie, we, we got so much on our plate right now. Like a cast net, you know, bringing that in, it's just, it's some, it, I said, I, I could put it under my podcast name. That way it's, it's, it's over here and we can get that done and not confuse our customers and get sidetracked. And 
he put a lot of time into that, knew exactly what he was after. He wanted a fast net that, I mean, it's like, it's got a turbo on it. And it's it, like exactly said, it. I mean, when you throw a pancake in that net, <laughs> you know, it's a pancake all the way down. That's it. And there's a lot of great nets out there. And, uh, definitely, like I said, we, we don't, I, I don't push, uh, the fish and fuel cast nets, um, uh, on my channel. You won't see it. I don't even have a, a fish and fuel website. We can go in there and purchase it. It's just, tacklebandit.com jamie k uh outdoors down in south carolina you can call his shop and he'll ship them to you and then christian moore up in virginia he helps me out a lot with that and he keeps inventory as well so those are places you can find it but appreciate that appreciate it. so getting back onto the uh the time of year and for like the lake and we're going to talk about that and then i want to talk about something that you guys you know personally what you guys do and, and some of your involvement um, for the lake, like I said, we're, we're in the winter time and you talked about the, the deep creeks and being at the mouths of the creeks as we come into spring, you know, as the weather transitions in March and stuff like that, what does a guy, how, what do those fish do? And what does a guy need to be looking for? What do, what do the fish do in the lakes? Do y'all notice? So normally, as the water like, temperature changes, it, it, they start going shallow, like they're going to spawn, mm -hmm. and they go through the motions. Even though they can't, only lake that can produce, or they can reproduce naturally, is in Santee Cooper lakes. Mm -hmm. um, but in South Carolina, in South Carolina, and so they, um, so they travel up and they get way up as far as they can in the creeks, and so then you target them real shallow. I mean, sometimes you're pulling six inches from the bank. You know, you're really close, close you can get. You know, shallow, way far back in the creeks, you know, way shallow on the points. You know, in the deeper water, you, get, you know, I mean, way up on the shoals as close as you can because they're up there and they're spawning and going through the motion. So, And, and you're talking about fast and furious. Some of the best fishing is shallow fishing. Mm -hmm. because I love shallow. Can, I'm a shallow guy. You can actually see the weight coming to the board before they hit it. And me and my brother, when we fish shallow, like in those creeks, we use a rod called a transient rod, and that's a rod right out the transient of the boat. And a few years ago, we was in a creek and about three foot of water, and a 16-pound fish hit that transient rod. It scared the— I bet it was violent. It scared us to death. And it's before like we could— hit it, you know, the water probably. Before we could get it out of the rod holder, it was 100 yards behind the boat. I mean, it was wild. That is but, the— But awesome it's fun in that, that shallow water. Fun, fun, fun. That is cool. And you said in three foot of water, that 16 pound fish hit it. I bet it did sound like an airplane crashed in the water. I mean, you probably thought an eagle was diving on you. Know what happened. <laughs> Until we see the rod bent over screaming line. That is fun fishing. Me personally, I'm a shallow water guy. I love shallow water fishing. Even throughout the winter, um, my confidence factor is, you know, 15 uh, foot or less. Um, a lot of times I just, you know, they may not, majority of the fish may not be there. I know they're residential fish that are just in that water column, but I love shallow water fish. And the biggest challenge with that though is, is they, they're, they're, they're easy to spook. Right. So last year we was at West Point Lake was fishing tournament and we, 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 we done found our spot and we knew the fish was there and we didn't have an 18 pounder in the boat. We was waiting for the next fish and this boat comes flying in there. They go to the back of the creek with the big motor. Where in, in my strategy, I won't pull to the creek with my trolling motor or idle back mm -hmm. there. As soon as you did, it blew the whole hole away. And so we, we, we stayed another hour just to see, but the fish were gone because they just vacated the area. Yeah. And so that's the only challenge about uh, is, is uh, that, that shallow water is a real spooky. And, you, you know, you got you to use a good strategy and, and, you know, don't use the big motor as much as you can as far as getting in there. Right. But we just usually start when we want in the deep area and start pulling in. Right. Now, a lot of times, and even like, you know, catfishing, I'll look at these secondary creeks and on these, you know, major creek arms that, that come off the lake and people say, well, you know, how are you supposed to use the big motor and, you know, run your graph and check? You had mentioned birds this time of year. A good thing is kind of look in that creek and you can tell if it's fishy. I think guys get forget so fast about using this and your senses and every part of that to determine if this feels right. That feeling goes a long ways where, you know, you don't have to run a big motor and run your graph it through there. If you got a little bit of understanding of the species, like what you guys have explained to us, seeing birds work, if birds are just sitting on the water, you know, like they're kind of waiting for something to happen, there's telltale signs, isn't there? 
Yeah, and I use binoculars as well. Yeah. And so, and especially when I'm trying to catch bait, and so I, I will stage up where I think bait's going to be, and I can use binoculars and get an area where I can see, and then you can tell if there's bait in there flipping or anything like that. So that's that's a key is having those binoculars. Yeah. Yeah, just seeing that little popping on the water. I mean, that tells you, that tells you, I mean, there's bait in there. There's going to be fish under. And early in the morning, sometimes you can see the fish breaking. And so it, 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 it definitely, you know, there's fish in there, so you can ease up in there. And, and one of the things, or a couple of things that I like to go with is, is records. You keep good records. You know, this time last year, the temperature was this. You found them here. Found them here. That's always a good starting point. Yeah. I mean, normally you, you can start there. And then obviously, the, the, probably the best way to do it is, is, is a network of buddies. Right. People that fish on the lake as much as you, people that put as much as you that you can trust and say, hey, this is where they're, hey, this is what's going on. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, local clubs, like Lake Murray's got uh, Midland Striper Clubs, and, and we fish a, a week, uh, a monthly tournament, but we all work together. You know, a lot of times mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if I win every tournament and I'm on big fish and the other guy's not, then am I really beating them? You know, right. but if I'm helping them right beside me and I can outfish them, then. Yeah, because it's, it's all in the detail. Yeah. And it's, who you're trying to outsmart that, that who's you're trying to outsmart the fish and outsmart the guy in the boat right across from you well and it's funny because you some of the details when i take people on a guide trip they say man it's easy and i tell them there's a lot of little things that make a big difference it could be the bait it could be the hook it could be the line it could be the speed but but every when and they go out there and, and say man i went out there where you took me and i didn't catch a fish it's like because there's a lot of little details that you don't tell everybody every detail. You're exactly right. Life is in the details. And that's funny. I always say, you know, in faith, in fishing, and in business, it all crosses over so much. You know, even like in business, transition from an angler to a businessman, it's when you're trying to make a decision and trying to operate or create something, it may seem like you just answer right away and like, man, that was, that was a good call. There's so many small factors that play a role that goes into making the right decision, like on the water or in business. And um, it, 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 it's crazy, you know. Like you say, you say that. So me and my wife, we decided to fish the Midland Stropper Cup last year. And um, January, we, I think we finished pretty good. February, we finished first. And so March, we, we decided to do something totally different and hero zero and we zeroed we went from first to last in one tournament because of the details we should have played it safe but we said now nah, we're going to do something different by the time we regrouped the wind was blowing so bad we couldn't get where we wanted to be yep. and and, and we, we made it a, 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 a bad i made a bad decision i was the captain of the boat she just followed me and we should have just played it safe but we was like we're going to go somewhere different and it cost us yeah i mean well and you know at least y'all kind of went into it like look we're doing something different here for sure but uh if you were going with your gut you would have done yeah what you originally went with that's the same way man on the water and in business a good operator it's 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 all the little things that you have seen and paid attention to uh that add up to a big result a big win uh or 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 or, or growing your business so it's funny and y'all mentioned the tournament scene Y'all are heavily invested in the tournament scene, not only with a tournament, but with raising money. Guys, I really want you to hear about what they got going on, and we're going to get uh, back to some more fishing information here, how to catch these fish. But talk about the tournament and how you guys are involved in is with the charity and with your faith, because faith is a big deal for me. Um, I grew up uh, in a Christian home, thankfully. Um, very grateful for that. Tell eight, us about eight it. Eight years ago, Mike Dillon, uh, with, uh, with RCR racing, he, he started a, a tournament series called Stripe Bass Challenge and he, he did one tournament at Murray. Then he did, uh, several tournaments at, um, Hartwell and he did one in High Rock, but he wanted to make a trail, but he never could make a trail because he's a race car guy. And so, um, and so several other people have tried to do a spinoff and get a, create a, a professional series, but his, his main focus was to raise money for the local food bank. And so, but me and my brother, we, 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 we were pastors and we both, we, we love the idea, but we wanted to make it bigger. And so, um, during COVID, it kind of shut down everything. And so me and my brother made a visit to Mike and said, Mike, Hey man, we would love to make this a trail. And he said, I, I just don't have the time to make it a trail. He said, 
but if you guys want to take it over, you can have it. And so me and my brother's like, hey, man, we want to, we want to make this. because we, we, There's several different trails that's tried it, but they never worked out. And it's our third year. And so what we did is we created to create a series. We have several sponsors that and Bass Pro was one of our biggest sponsors that would give us product. It would give us money. And then a lot of other sponsors would give us, uh, would give us product. And so we would have a captain's meeting on the night before the tournament. And all the money raised for that captain's meeting would go to that food bank. And so when we took it over, we was right around 700,000 meals. And we reached over 100, uh, a million meals this last year. And so last year we was able to raise $62,000 to a local nonprofit where we took the uh, tournament trail. And then we even expanded it this year to be going beyond food banks. We did some uh, children's home. We did some for veterans. And so we wanted to reach a wider spectrum. And so what, what's happening now is, is communities saying, hey, how can we come? Can you come to our community? Because we, we want to get back to the community. I mean, it's all about giving back to that's our awesome. community and helping people. And that's what we, if, if we couldn't do that, we wouldn't do the tournament trail. Yeah, absolutely. And how can people learn more about your tournament trail and the dates and the events that you guys have? Because you're not only fishing a tournament, but you're helping a lot of people with a cause. And I have, the more I go in my career, the more my upbringing and that, that new man inside of you tells you, you know what, God gave you a platform, this platform, whether it's you're on the water as a guide, whether you're a public speaker, whether you're putting on a tournament or something, if God gives you a platform, doing something in some way to monetize it to where you can carry out his work and help others, that's that's the main thing. And I've, I've said many times, Lord, podcasting is hard to carve out an hour in the day. We're all so busy, especially you guys and in here. And I was like, you just, I'm going to, I'm going to make it available. We're going to share the information. And if you bless, bless it. And however way you see getting plugged in with organizations, you guys will be for sure. One that I want to work with because of the work you do. We um, on Facebook is where you can find us, or we have a website this year. We, we have a, a sponsor just said, Hey, we, we want to get your website. So we have a, the, the Stripe Bass Challenge on Facebook or the Stripe Bass Challenge dot com is the way to get us, www.thestripebasschallenge dot com. Stripe Bass Challenge on Facebook and Stripe Bass Challenge dot com. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. the Stripe Bass um, Challenge. And one of our driving motives was that obviously we're pastors and we enjoy striper fishing. So it's, we've like, how can we combine the two and still reach people? Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, you know, one thing I always said is, uh, it's, it's kind of a joke going in the church that I pastor, but the name of my boat is a visitation. So, I went on visitation. So when people ask me, I always say, I've been on visitation all day. Or I so love sometimes it. literally I'm on visitation and sometimes I'm on visitation. That um, is but awesome. it's always an opportunity when I'm out there, you know, the first thing we always do, no matter what we do, we will we'll thank the Lord for enjoying, uh, creating something that we can enjoy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think God is... We, we think about God being in a little box that he, that he's, that he don't want us to have fun. I, I think God's in everything, and he's created fishing for us to enjoy, so among right. the other things. And, uh, and striper fishing is so enjoyable. So we thought, how can we give back? And so we got with Mike, and we've seen some of the stuff he did. You know, one thing that we're doing uh, this coming month in February, we're going to be at Lake Murray at my home lake. And so we had a local church jump in, say, hey, we want to we wanna, uh, feed y'all. We want to host y'all. And so what they did last year is we, they have a, a ministry that they get service dogs for veterans. And so we're able to raise enough money for a service dog for a veteran that was in need of that. And so this year That's in February, awesome. and, and what's it's amazing is we don't, we don't realize, but all the money that we raise comes from the people that fish our tournament. So, you know, so it's not necessarily about winning a prize, which a lot of them are donating. There are a lot of really good prizes, but these people are just as important in our in our work because if they didn't give we couldn't give back exactly and, and right. so it's awesome that this the people in our that fish our tournament are like us they want to help people in need if, and so it makes a big difference is people able to donate without fishing the tournament yeah. because the tournament is 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 just an engine that mm -hmm. that is in my mind how i'm seeing it is the tournament is an engine and you guys are driving this car and you're taking it to a greater purpose. And 
shining the light on Christ and, and showing people. Um, I, I could totally see where somebody would want to just donate because of what you guys are doing. Is there a way that somebody could donate to what y'all do? And, and as far as the non like for the tournament where it goes into that or like the nonprofit, like yeah, there- so what we do is, is the, the week before the tournament, we put a link on the website on our, on our, on our um, Facebook page. Mm-hmm. So if people want to give to the food bank, but they find out who we're giving it to and they can do it, give it directly to them or give it directly to us and postmark it for that nonprofit. They can do that. That's great. That's great. And I love how you said, like, you know, it is easy for people to think of, um, God is like, oh, he's just a, a ruler and he wants us to, uh, I've been in a lot of Southern Baptist churches. You got some that are, they love life. They enjoy life. They want to enjoy God's creation. I've been in some where um, it's like, you know, you need to be on visitation every day. And we should <laughs> on visitation on the boat. But like, you know, it's real strict and they seem absolutely miserable. And I question those sometimes because I'm like, you know, that is not what God wants for our life, man. It he, he, they say, well, you know, fishing, that's not doing the Lord's work. Well, he puts you in this because if I'm an outdoorsman, that may be the time, that may be the only place that I hear, you know. And, and the challenge is you got to build a bridge yeah. that earn the right to share the gospel mm-hmm. or your faith with somebody. Yeah. And so fishing is a common denominator. People do it through golf or do whatever. And when I take people guiding, the first thing I do is say, hey, can I pray for you today? I have never... Had anybody say, I don't want you to pray for me. And then that opens the door for conversation later on. And unless they can walk on water, they're going to hear the gospel at some point, point of that day. Love it. You and, can't um, get out of that boat. And guess what? You ain't swimming in January. You know, one of, one of, my, greatest, <laughs> one of my greatest fishing trips was about three and a half years ago. Uh, a friend of mine wanted to go fishing. He was getting ready to get married. And it, specifically, he said, my, my uh, fiance is not, she don't know the Lord. And so he said, uh, he said, tell your wife to go fishing. So, so me and my wife and, and uh, him and his wife or him and his fiance went out to the lake and, and we had a pretty good day of fishing. And then we started talking about the Lord and, and you know, before you know it, uh, she's bowing her head and my wife's leading her to the Lord. That's great. And, you know, and, and that in, in turn, they got married and, you know, they got plugged in our church and, you know, but one thing is, you know, that one fishing trip, that one time my wife and me said, yeah, we'll go, you know, that one person now, it's got a decision for eternity. They're not the you know. absolutely, and so it you know every opportunity like that. It's just unbelievable, you know. And uh, and my wife sometimes she struggles to get out and go fishing, but when opportunities like that arise, you know she's just like me, you know. As many people as we can take with us, you know. Uh, absolutely. If you look at Paul, he said, and I I, I believe this, and I, I try to live my life is Jesus Christ and him crucified. You know that's yeah. that's the main subject. Everything yep. that we talk about, everything we focus on. Is, is about our Heavenly Father, yep. you know, and just for us to get an opportunity to love this and still do it, mm-hmm. fear the gospel is just amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much, guys, for diving in that. That was, we were just going to touch on that, but we take all the time in the world, and, and we're about to rope it back in, guys, to where we're going to teach you how to catch more striper. Um, but just for reference before we do, uh, if you skip through that in any way, you need to go back because what we just talked about is more important than any boat you'll ever buy, uh, more important than any rod you'll ever use. It is more important than any fish you'll ever catch or any tournament that you'll ever win. Um, at the end of the day, that is the most important decision that you can make in your life. That does not mean you have to be perfect. I am imperfect. Mm-hmm. If you want to see some mistakes, Bo, follow me from when I was a child to where I'm at now, follow me from last week. It's, a, it's not saying you have to be perfect, but asking Christ to come into your life and, and, and be in control of it. I mean, that it really, um, that's the best decision you can make. You know, that's the thing. You ain't got to give up nothing. You ain't got to give up fishing guys. You ain't got to do none of that. Um, but that's more important than anything we're going to talk about. But, uh, back to fishing, um, because we will stay on that topic because I enjoy it. Uh, Lake fishing and river fishing for striper. You had mentioned that you like to go up to uh, Watts Bar and stuff. What is, you know, for what are some of the differences in how you target them? Is there anything different when you're in the rivers? I mean, when when you're targeting them in the rivers and when you're targeting them in the lake, is there a different approach? Uh, 
What are some differences? The biggest thing is seasonal. Seasonal. I mean, obviously, the, when they start going up the rivers mm -hmm. in the spring, that's when you can really, really target them. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, in the, they're not in there. In the, they stay in the deeper water in the wintertime. And, and the challenge is it's usually early bite as fish start to migrate. So you, a lot of times I've fished in the river, it's a two-hour window for say in the morning, and then you got to catch the migration. Right. And so if you catch a migration right, it could be an all day bite, but it may just be a first thing in the morning bite they're feeding, you know, and so that's the challenge. And in the Santee River system, a lot of times, you know, there's so much body of water, there's so much, so far a river to run. If you're not in the right spot at the right time, it, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. and what, so, yeah. And what makes a big difference too is uh, the power generation, generation of the, when they're generating water. Mm -hmm. That just seems to get everything stirred up and get the fish really working. Like, we can be up uh, behind the Russell Dam and, and, and Clark Hill, and and it could be nothing going on, and then they start generating at 1 o'clock, and then, bam, it's just like a flip a switch, feeding time, and it's crazy. You know, it's just wide open. And you're just talking about staying in the spot. So if we know that generation schedule is going to happen, we may not catch a fish for four hours, but we're going to work that spot and wait. And when that generation happens, it, it could change the day within 15 minutes. That's wild. So just knowing kind of like a schedule, using your phone to look at, you know, when they're going to generate water, time of year, stuff like that. You may not see the results. You may have to wait, but the fish are coming. Oh, yeah. You know, so, or they're there and they're going to get, right. they're going to get fired up. And the biggest thing is, you know, having confidence too. Mm -hmm. Years and years of doing it, the same spot, same area, knowing it's going to happen, no one's going to show up. I mean, you know, we fished a tournament last year, and I wasn't able to be on the boat. Uh, I had uh, I helped to something out in my team, my son, and one of my partners are on the boat, and and they said, "What do we do?" I said, "You know, I said do what we've always done," and so they circled a spot all day long. I mean, all day long, and the tournament was I think from seven to maybe three. I can't remember six to two. Actually, Chip Bragg won it. Um, my man Chip, shout out to Chip. My uh, Chip. my son got second. <laughs> yeah, but they, anyway, they waited it out, and uh, and around Good two o'clock, uh, they got three fish in a row, you know, and then a little bit later they got another fish. So right at the end of the day, and they knew the fish were there. They knew where they were going to bite. They knew what they were going to bite on, and it just it, it was unbelievable how quickly it changed. But they knew they were there, and they just patiently waited. Now, when they got there that morning, um, there was eight boats there, and when they when they stayed, they were the last boat. But they finally showed up, and they, you know, they did what they had been trained to do, what they believed in, and, and it paid off. That's, That's killer. So. That is killer, man. And let me ask you about that. When a guy is out there, you had mentioned it, that a lot of times before a tournament, um, you guys are more scouting than anything. It's, it's really about looking uh, and putting a game plan together. When you're looking and you're marking uh, Striper, are you looking – uh, to see fish in a particular area or, or is it more like looking for like the signs of fish? And if you find fish, how many striper does it take for you to mark, for you to say, okay, this is worth spending time on tournament day to target them? Because the guy may go through there and you say, oh, there's three fish here, you know, staged up just like you talked about uh, earlier. Is that enough? Or are you looking for a wolf pack or, a, you know, how, How much activity needs to be there for you to say, tomorrow we're coming back here and we're going we're gonna to fish this or a guy to drop lines? If we're just fishing to have fun, well, you want a wolf pack. Mm -hmm. But if we're fishing for a specific type of fish, big I fish. mean, a big fish, one or two marks would be plenty. Does the big fish hang out with the small fish? It depends on what lake, but there is times they will. Does the big fish hang out underneath the small fish? Most of the time they do because people think that the bigger the bait, the bigger the fish. But most of my experience is those, those big fish are lazy. Yeah. And then a lot of times, you know, I told you I caught that big fish on that cork. A lot of times the smaller fish are feeding around the boat and the bigger fish are out further away and just, you know, watching that feeding activity. And a lot of times the outside planing board or the back, the furthest cork away from the boat would catch the bigger fish. That's wild. So, like, let's say we were, you know, uh, uh, trolling motors down and, you know, we're, we, we're downlining. Let's say we're dropping our lines straight down and, you know, you're catching them, but you're still, you're moving. Um, that slip bobber that's way out there or that direction, for, that's the one that'll catch that biggest mm -hmm. fish. You would think the bigger fish 
would roll up. I've never been able to do this because I've never been the biggest guy in the room, but I'd feel like if I was the biggest fish, if I wanted to go to the front row, I'd go to the front row and get a hot dog. What keeps the big fish away from the small fish, do you think? Why is, do you think the bigger fish stay away? Or I know underneath them, they're looking for the easy meal, kind of like something that's just going to fall right in their mouth. But the reason I had asked that was because a lot of my questions come from past interviews and past experience seeing it myself on the water where the big fish are not in the thick of it in just about every species with the smaller fish. What do you think keeps the bigger fish on the outside? Is it just still an easy meal? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell you what I, one thing, the reason I like striper fishing. Yeah. And there's only two types of fish in the lake, stripers and bait, because they eat yeah. everything. Uh, they're yeah. probably a freshwater shark. So to me, sure. those, hey, when the right bait there. gets in there, I mean, they're just so aggressive. Those little fish are so good, like piranhas. And they're just so aggressive. And then as they get bigger and slower, they're like, there's an easy way to do things. <laughs> you right. know, and so I think they've learned as they've aged. Now, I could be wrong. Them little fish are just so aggressive. I mean, why go in there and fight over bait when it's eventually going to get to you? Or right. you can wait your turn or you can actually wait for it to fall. Because yeah. there's a lot of times, for some reason, stripers will just kill it. Will just kill your bait and, and then just let it let it sit there and so a lot of times when we're fishing the same way like we're down rodding we will see them fish just i mean arch just worm up and so we'll drop that that uh, bait wet at the very bottom just barely reel it off the bottom maybe one turn and that's when you get a bigger fish because they're cool. down there at the very bottom and they're just kind of you know I, sometimes i always we call it like a nursery or the school school mm -hmm. of fish and then Schoolies. you know and then you just wait them out and but that bigger fish sometimes are just lingering on the bottom with the outside and you just uh, put the bait right there in the face. A lot of times you catch that bigger fish after the school, all the schoolies come through. Yeah. And you, you got to believe yep. in your spot. Yep. Even though, and so, you know, as long as we keep upgrading, we stay in that spot because those bigger fish will eventually come. Yeah. Because those schoolies have finished feeding and they leave. And then I think sometimes, you know, like a, a, a buck, you know, when he, when he gets old, he's by himself a lot, a loner. And some Very of them true. bigger fish, the, the only place I've ever seen, 20 plus found fish schooling is, is in Tennessee. We're just, that's, that's when sometimes there's a, a frenzy taking place and stuff where it's just every man for himself. But, um, no, your theories and your opinions, I, 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 I love to hear it. Sometimes there's no scientific data to match what we say, but you guys are very successful in what you do. Been doing it for so long. I, I feel like any, any theory that you guys have is, is huge weight. Yeah, I mean, I you know, just just kind of throw out a, a shout out to Chip Bragg. You know, yeah. last year I called him. And I said, "Hey, man, I've been on the lake," and he said, "These fish are right here, and the better ones are right on the bottom." He said, "Do this," and so I slowed everything down, used heavier weights, and went slow, and and I actually won the won the tournament. <laughs> you know, but he gave me that you know that what I need, and I mean, he, he's one guy you can call on, and and you know, obviously he does it for a living, and I, and I trust him, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and uh, it was just unbelievable. You could see a lot of fish but they were right dead on the bottom and they almost looked like catfish, mm -hmm. but knowing where he caught them, knowing he had caught them, yep. I had faith in it and we were able to do that. And he helped me last year too. So when I told you sometimes we chum when the fish are dormant, he, he said, get a spinning rod with no weight and throw a piece of chum out. And so when you throw your chum out, that chum's barely sinking and he was catching a lot of his fish when the fishing was hard. And he told me, if you want to catch fish when the fishing's hard, that's why I was catching his quality fish with that chum. And, and, and so it, it, so it, it was, and when, when we cut chum up, a lot of times on our rods, the chum would be smaller than the chum we use on our rods because it, the bigger bait, the bigger the eye candy, I, I say sometimes. And we, we've, and a lot of people say that the, the fish won't eat the chum, um, but when we clean the fish before, we have 32 pieces of chum in his belly. Really? Then I mean, they keep feeding, keep feeding, keep feeding. And a lot of people say a fish won't bite twice. My granddad, um, Years ago, I never forget it. He um he, he used to pull rebel plug and and he pulled a rebel plug and broke one off in his striper, and then went turned around and come back through it and caught the same striper. Had the plug still with in his mouth, hooks in their mouth. Still in his mouth. So for all you people out there that give us fishermen grief about the hooks hurting the fish, they just debunked that. Just so y'all know, yeah. <laughs> the good Lord knew how they were going to feed and what he designed. And I promise you, the reason we feel pain, well, if you put a hook in your mouth, the reason we feel pain is because the Lord didn't knew we won't go swim around and be eating a brim that has a 
uh, a spine on it like that that's going to stab through it. If he did, we wouldn't have the nervous system we have in our mouth. So that proves that. And that is interesting. So with it in his mouth, circle back and still mm -hmm. on a down rod, I've seen it where he hit this bait. And I'm telling you, he's hooked and came up and hit the next one. And he had both where we're, I was kind of like a few years ago, my brother, <laughs> he just turned to me because before, when I first started cyber fishing, when I got out of the military, I didn't have any rod holders. I had a pontoon. And so we got there and we, I just leaned the rods over and, and, um, and I had some people from our church there. And, um, and, it, and when it hit me, I was like, man, that rod could get snatched out. When it hit me, that rod got snatched out. And then before I turned the other rod, it got snatched out. And this, this old lady from my church, she said, now, preacher, I'm going to put my hand on my ears. If you need to say a bad word, go ahead. I said, <laughs> I said I'm good to go. And so, and so I lost two brand new rods, but within 15 minutes, I caught a, a fish with a hook in his mouth. And one of my rods I got back. No yes, way. I promise you. I promise you. That is wild. So that just kind of shows yeah. the, the aggressiveness yeah, of these fish. Right. They are an apex predator without mm. a doubt. Because, I mean, like I said, in the summertime, I have fished live bait um, going over uh, 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 humps and stuff in the lake and have caught striper. And, I mean, they choked a whole brim oh, of yeah. bluegill. And, um, I mean, they will they will go after just about anything. You see, a lot of people don't use brim, but we found when the brim are on the beds, the stripers are feed on them. Mm -hmm. And so we, we figured that out a few years ago. And we'd have our kids at night in the pond kind of catch brim. Because yeah. you can use them legally as long as you catch them on a hook and sinker. So we'd have them out catching brim. They'd have fun. And we'd go use them for, for, for bait. That's time. right. You know, my goal is actually, um, I've mentioned this several times, is having guys come on here who only obsess about, let's just say, brim fishing. Where they go to lakes to target big shell cracker or brim and to have them on. And everybody be like, well, why would I listen to a podcast about brim and stuff like that because guys if you're watching this you need to know about fish habits in the lake that you're fishing because when crappy go on the beds if you're a catfish a lot of times fishing close to the bank using crappy mm -hmm. is a fire bait because that is naturally what is vulnerable and easily accessible at that time same way with like y'all said about the brim uh on the beds you know that is for not just striper because there's so many things that y'all are saying that I'm thinking in my mind for other species that guys I've had and I've talked to and seen line up. Whatever is currently happening in your lake, that's probably a good bait to start. Mm -hmm. And if I can have those guys come in who obsess about the brim, then that lets us all know, okay, time of year, water temperature, they're doing this. Okay, that that is a time where my fish that I target, whatever your your species is, uh, it's probably dialed into it, you know. So, uh, man, that is. You know, when the stripers eat anything, I mean, we caught a striper and had a twelve-inch largemouth in his belly before. Man, yeah. Chad, catfish. Now, another thing is perch. They they love perch. Mm -hmm. Well, one year we ran out of bait, and at Murray, there was a bunch of perch around the dam, uh, around the boat ramp. And so we went and cast cast net and went back out where, the, where we ran out of bait, and they wasn't biting. And then we started power chumming with all the perch. And then all of a sudden, every rod, the boat started going off because they started feeding Smoking on those perch. Smoking them on perch. Yeah. Man. Yeah, and I love I love using perch for bait. One, because once you're in them, you're in them. And uh, two, I mean, they're just, they're, they're, they're abundant. And, uh, and they are feisty jokers. Let's talk about hooking the bait. A lot of guys can mess up. Let's talk about how um, you hook a shad, heron, and a perch, you know, like, some of those baits because a guy often will wonder when do I hook it in like between the tail and the back dorsal fin should I hook it between the eyes should I hook it from the bottom up like the bottom jaw coming out the nose let's talk about the right way to hook a bait because if you hook a bait the wrong way striper will look at it and it will not get touched talk about well, it. well the biggest thing first of all you want to hook the bait where when you set the hook if you use where well, you want to set the hook that that bait will not get foul hooked. Mm. So you want that spin that around, spin around. So you want that hook to be to come out of that bait and to go into that fish. And so the the the, the best way for herring is that normally how we do it with herring always is through the nose. You know, always through the nose. That keeps them lively. That keeps them alive on the hook a very long time. Unless we want a reaction bite, like in the summertime, sometimes early spring, 
we'll hook them on the tail and we'll throw them out and kind of on a free spool and then them jokers will shoot up off the bottom and then fish will smack them. Reaction but, bite. Reaction bite. And, then, and a lot of people, when they cut bait, they do other things, but primarily that's the only two ways I use herring. And um, and minners, I usually go through the underneath and go right to the mouth and back out the mm -hmm. top of the nose and because they're pretty hardy and they yeah. and they'll live. Same with and brim and perch. perch. Yeah. Yeah. Same with brim and perch, yeah. And Gizzard Shad's got a big nose, and so some people will put it through both nostrils and some people hook it through the lip, you know, um, but it really depends on hook size for us on the, on the gizzard shot. That was going to be my next question. I'm glad you said that. You know, cause, uh, cause the bigger the, the gizzard, the bigger the hook that we do. Cause, cause the last thing you want to do is set a hook and hook the big nose of a gizzard. Mm -hmm. And then you just set the hook on a bait. You just yes. set a hook on the fish. Yes, absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned hook and y'all answered those questions very well. Thank you so much. And you know, a lot of people don't realize at catch fever, all the factors that we put into play when designing a rod. And one of the major factors when we're designing striper stealth rods is, you know, hooks that guys are going to use, you know, because hooks are such a critical factor because if you use too thick of a gauge hook for the size bait and the type of bait you're using, you will kill that bait or not allow it to, to present itself naturally. Mm -hmm. And for us, when designing a rod is, we have to look at what gauge hook the majority are using and how they're using it because that tells us if we put too much power in that rod, if that's going to straighten a hook out when it shouldn't have straightened out, you know, when there's times where you got to use a thin wire. And um, what do you guys recommend hook size and gauge size of the hook? What, like for this time of year, winter, and then going into spring? Primarily, uh, we use Gamagatsu octopus bin. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will use circle hooks and different we, we've always had good with with, with gamagatsu octopus bin we use a two ot mostly for regular size herring if we get smaller bait we go to even to size one or size two and then with gizzard shad we go to a four ot to a five ot maybe six ot depends how big he is and sometimes we may put a singer hook in them you know it depends really how big that gizzard shad singer is. hook just for people listening that is a treble hook now is that what you're talking about or do yeah. you tie a smaller circle a treble hook Yep, and just stick it in the back of the fish. But one thing that we do compared to a lot of people is we use smaller hooks. I just, we just, I mean, a lot of times our hooks are, I mean, like with gither shad, you know, if people use a 14, 16 inch gither shad, they might have a six or seven odd hook. We'll use a four. You know, I, I just think the natural, and one thing that. that we do is we uh, go up through the mouth and then we'll go out through one nostril on the side so we can pull that thing loose. And, and another thing that we do a lot of times that people don't realize is when people, when stripers feed, primarily it's always head first and, and so a lot of times when we are missing them on down rods or something we will hook them in the dorsal fin where they will still live and when they start because a lot of times when they start and what we what most people do is they start sucking that thing down then you just jerk it right back out and turn the head instead of letting them choke it down and so the rod, when they, roll it up. rod roll it up and so what they do is when you put it in the dorsal fin then that hooks closer to the mouth so if you do Get a little early. A lot of times that saves you. Um, so especially in a tournament. Setting. Oh yeah, a tournament setting. And you know we were always known for years as small bait fishermen. I mean we my favorite bait was herring, mm -hmm. and we finally have got into the big bait the industry, which it's Don't it's a lot of it. yeah got 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 yeah. a lot of and it's a lot it's different. A oh yeah, and it's that just so much different, and it's so intimidating to try to figure it out because you know herring you know we had it dialed in when, you know we're trying and and part of the thing that we do a lot of people don't do is people pull one or the other mm -hmm. well we'll have four different baits out there at one time mm -hmm. and then if the, if it if they all target one bait man i'll switch every bait if they if they're specifically to one type of rod weight or pull i'll change everything mm -hmm. i mean so, some people they they're 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 they're, they're you know their tunnel vision but I'll try a lot of things, and what it works that day might not work the next day. But if I got to take all my take all my hooks off, retie all my hooks, we'll do it to get the yeah, to get the result. That's awesome. And it, you know, it's worked sometimes. But you know, uh, my one of my greatest buddies, I'm gonna throw a chat from Ricky Dubose, who taught me a whole lot when I moved back from Alaska. Probably the best guide on Clark Hill. Um, he's always working, always busy, always trying um, to do something to get that reaction bite, get that fish. And, you know, sometimes it's changing hook, sometimes it's throwing bait out, you know, sometimes it's reeling up, sometimes shorten this, and, but he will continue to work until he gets it done. And 99.9% .9 he gets it done. That is awesome. That's awesome. And the last question here, cause I mean, we have been talking a while and guys, I could 
I'm going to have to have you guys back for another podcast because there's just so much knowledge here and I have learned so much. And I want to ask you about this and ask what y'all use because one thing that I have noticed striper fishing is the leader line can be a major thing. You can have the right bait, the right hook size, the right rod, everything, and miss it from the leader line. I've seen us downsize leader lines a lot of times. And even in Chesapeake Bay, it, you know, we'll be going after 50, 60 pound striper, have a 30 pound leader and drop it down to like a 20. And you have to back that drag off, mm -hmm. but boom, 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 start hooking up. What's y'all's theory on the leader line size and what size do y'all use? Leader line, we always use smaller than the main line. For one, when you break off, you won't lose everything. And so that's, that's, that's a factor, but mm -hmm. we always use the the best fluorocarbon you can buy at the thinnest diameter. And right now we, we, we use a cigar and we use a uh, sunline. Sun mm -hmm. It's the two that we like right now. Yeah. And, you know, we, we used to use a uh, gamma and some other ones, but some of them, they, they're real abrasive and they break easily. And so under pressure, we like to use those two. And we like to keep our drags really set loose and then tighten our drags after we get the fish on, right. if we can adjust it. Yep. And it really just depends on what lake too, like so at it, 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 Clark Hill and the Savannah River Lakes, there's a little more forgiveness, the water's a little dirtier. And so we'll use 20 pound main line a lot of times in 16 liter. And then, but on Lake Murray, the water's just so much clearer. Right. And so sometimes even main line, you know, I, I run primarily 12 pound test line, but my leader, sometimes I go down to 10 or to eight especially in the summer months when it's real finicky, when it matters, mm -hmm. smaller hooks, all that stuff makes a factor in. And sometimes the leader, you know, uh, sometimes like if I have to use a, you know, like if I use a big bait at Murray and I use heavier main line, I'll make a six or seven foot leader sometimes. I was just about to you ask know. you how long But standard leaders? usually is about three feet for us. Three foot Yeah, leaders. it don't so matter when what. I, when I use those, uh, I call them noodle rods, the ones I got you looking at. Mm -hmm. I, I use a, a probably a six to 10 foot leader sometimes because I want that bait to look as natural as it can be, and I've won more tournaments yes. on the free lines yep. because they look more natural. Mm -hmm. And 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 I'm telling you that that makes us game changers. If it you is. if you can give it, you know, it's a down rod, and you can't get a lot of leaders because they swim together. But the but the longer the leader, as long as you can get the fish in, as far as with the rod bending over, it, it to me it, the more natural that bait looks, the mm -hmm. better it will. You would get more bites. That's killer bigger fish. Because designing the striper stealth rods, the line came into a big play as well because, you know with the line and the rods and how they correlate is we needed to make a rod to where when a guy wanted to really downsize that rod under extreme stress of tension, something has to give. If something doesn't get people who just absolutely love stiff rods, there's a place for stiff rods. I mean, I like to snatch a fish's head off just like anybody, especially bass fishing with the, uh, with like a, a Carolina rig or, or something on it where I can just drag that worm and fill them and just, just pop him. I mean, just hit him as hard as I can. But for what we're talking about from a lot of these applications is that is not your friend. It's mm -hmm. it, because if there's no give, if there's no being something breaks and we wanted to make a rod where you have power, but a guy can really drop that leader down. And when you're dealing with new people on the boat, they bump that drag mm -hmm. and it does not take an experienced angler long to realize that drag has been bumped because that rod is doing something it it's at a critical angle that is normally isn't before that drag starts to slip but if you've got the right rod and the right gear it will give you those three seconds to say oh let me back that drag off mm -hmm. you know don't touch that right there don't adjust that and you, and you mentioned rods you so know many factors our, 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 our wives get on us all the time because we have several sets of rods yeah we mentioned 10 pound tests we mentioned 12 pound tests mm -hmm. 20 pound tests and we, we 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 try to we try to keep a, a wide variety so we ain't got to retie Every time we go somewhere, mm -hmm. we, we can we have a set of cut bait rods, free line rods, down rods, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you know all these rods. So we, we you know when we go fishing a lot of times, we have a lot of extra rods because yeah. we may be pulling free lines in the morning, and then when the fish go, especially in the summertime, go deep, we go we go with with uh, switch the approach with cut bait rods. Yeah. And so we have anchors and cut bait rods ready to go. So as soon as we switch over, we got two anchors and we got people boom boom boom. We got a little system, so we won't we won't waste any time. I love it's, it. it's definitely definitely critical and then we'll we we'll use even heavier leaders and heavier rods because mm -hmm. if you get them in the debris you want to be able to pull them out that's right about debris that's right well guys that is killer information if 
you listen to this whole podcast, you can not only uh, give you some guidance on uh, what's important in life and, and uh, incorporating Christ in, in your decisions, but as well as being productive on the water with catching striper. I mean, this has really taught me a lot, and uh, I know it's going to teach somebody else. And again, just tell folks how they can follow you guys and um, the website again, if you would point that out again. It's bass com, and then uh, the bass Challenge on Facebook. Good deal. Good deal. Well, guys, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. You drove along uh, ways to be here, and I do not take it lightly, and uh, I can't wait to work with you guys here in 2024, um, not only on the gear side, but in incorporating in your mission. And um, what you guys are doing is what I hope to do with this podcast in the future. And, uh, you know, I always tell people, if you want to, if you're trying to get somewhere, uh, it's best to hang around the guys that are standing where you're at, where you're trying to get. And, um, you guys are that guys in my eyes. So I really appreciate y'all being here. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you guys so much for watching another episode here on the fish and fuel podcast, talking about striper fishing with these awesome anglers right here. Uh, if you want more, uh, you can follow us on the fish and fuel, uh, Facebook page. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, where on all those platforms, YouTube, we post the full episode, and on the other platforms, uh, we post uh, tips and tricks clipped from this podcast. It will really help you catch more fish. And of course, we're going to be merging this podcast back onto Spotify as well. So the podcasting apps uh, here very soon uh, will be available to you as well. So thank you guys so much for watching. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Fish and Fuel Podcast.